welcome to our fourth in a series of lectures celebrating the 50th anniversary of Black Studies here at Duke University. Uh, our guest today is Kanohi Nishikawa, who is Assistant Professor of English and African American Studies at Princeton University. Uh, just a few words about Kanohi. Um, I was fortunate um, to have Kanohi uh, serve as a TA of mine a few years ago. Um, I was also fortunate to serve um, on his dissertation committee. The director of that committee, Tom Ferraro, is sitting here at the table. Um, and kind of my, my favorite story about Kanoe, um, when I teach graduate courses, I often require students to write book reviews. That's actually part of the writing that they do in the class. Um, because most often, the first publications graduate students will get will be a book review in a journal because most senior scholars don't want to or have the time to write book reviews. Um, and Kanoe had written a review for a class uh, for a book by a scholar named David Eichert, who teaches at Vanderbilt. Um, and we had talked a little bit about the fact because there was some trepidation about <laughs> him because he had, hadn't done an academic book review before. Um, and he did review, and, and of course I post many of these reviews um, on my website, New Black Man in Exile. Um, years later, <laughs> um, working with another graduate student at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Tyler Bunsey, um, he reviewed Kanohi's <laughs> um, wonderful new book, University of Chicago Press, Street Players, uh, Black Pulp Fiction, and uh, the Underground Literary. Um, and he's going to talk to us today about Fran Ross and her book, Oreo, an underground classic in its own right of African-American satire. Um, Fran Ross, who was a former writer on the Richard Pryor show in the mid-1970s. Um, so with no further ado, Kanohi Nishikawa. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, and thanks for coming out in this last week of classes. <laughs> it's. Um, it's a beautiful space, and I'm happy that you're here with me. So it's a tremendous honor to come back to Duke as part of a series celebrating 50 years of African American, of African and African American studies at the university. Uh, for us graduate students, the department's interdisciplinary formation served as a model uh, for how to think across field parameters about research, writing, and perhaps most important, undergraduate teaching. Uh, the first course I ever taught at the college level was an undergraduate seminar, one of the sections of Lit 20, titled Black Popular Fiction. The course over-enrolled at 25 students, but the even better news was that it attracted a full class of students of color, 23 black identifying, two Latinx. As I've seen many of these students go on to enjoy rewarding careers and joyful lives, I'm reminded that black popular fiction was made possible by AAAS's then novel courses in black critical theory and popular culture, taught by the likes of Juanima Lubiano, John Jackson, and Grant Farad. So today I wanna to thank AAAS for providing that model among so many others because black popular fiction not only became the subject of my dissertation and first book, as a course, it showed me the value of a literature instructor reaching out to students of color and saying we can create a space of learning together. Uh, for today's event in particular, I wanna thank Tyra Davis for coordinating my visit, and of course, Mark Anthony Neal for extending the invitation. I wouldn't be here coming back to Duke in this capacity without man's guidance, mentorship, and support over the past decade. And I continue to be humbled by the example he leads professionally and personally. So today's talk is offered very much in the spirit of man and his profound influence on my work and career. Fran Ross's 1974 novel, Oreo, begins with a visual joke. In recounting how the protagonist's parents, a Jewish man and a black woman, announce their union to their parents, Ross pokes fun at the petty prejudices of interracial contact. Frida Schwartz takes her son Schmuel's announcement that he's marrying a black girl and dropping out of school as the realization of her worst nightmare. 
italicized Yiddish expressions, chupa, schwatze, riboyne shel olem, pepper the page before Frida kicks the bucket with a great geschrei. As over the top as her reaction is, it's the response by James Clark, father to Helen, that arrests the eye. As Ross notes, he managed to croak one anti-Semitic Goldberg before he turned to stone, as it were, in his straight back chair, his body a rigid half swastika. The image which appears at the top of the following page is that of a crooked line. But once you read these words, you can't unsee the swastika. <laughs> that would be the point, since the novel, a satirical retelling of the myth of Theseus from Athens through the experiences of a black Jewish girl from Philadelphia, is supposed to start with a curse. Christine, the daughter of this coupling, is fated to not belong, to not fit in with either her black or her Jewish side of the family. That she pushes on in life despite the path laid out for her is the thrust of the narrative, and it's Ross's irreverent comic sensibility that illuminates the way. After all, how ridiculous is it for James to be frozen in half a swastika? There's something pathetic, finally, about an anti-Semite whose hate is only half-hearted. Oreo is one of the great forgotten black novels of the late 1960s and early 1970s. Forgotten because it's a period in African-American literary history that's been reserved almost exclusively for the black arts movement and responses to it by black women writers such as Toni Morrison, Entezake Shange, and Alice Walker. It's a period that's been defined less by aesthetics and more by cultural politics, a proxy for struggles between black power, cultural nationalism, and black feminism. The novelists left out of the picture are the eccentric satirists, William Melvin Kelly, Charles Wright, Clarence Major, Fran Ross, who in another context or anthology would immediately be recognized as high postmodernists. That more general literary histories have also ignored these writers, though some were published by the same houses as the best known postmodernists, signals a deeper aversion to recognizing black postmodern satire as either postmodern or black. In this way, American and African American literary history has failed a generation of novelists who were misfits in their time and created great art precisely because of that. Oreo lends us a method not only for appreciating the work of this generation, but for understanding their significance in literary history. It's certainly true that the novel deconstructs grand narratives, advances cultural hybridity, and embraces parody and pastiche, all hallmarks of postmodern style. But what makes this a specific contribution to black postmodernism is the fact that Ross designed her own book. Working with her partner, Anne Grie Falcone, Ross selected the visual elements that would complement the text and decided how Oreo would be laid out. In effect, she was the novel's author, graphic artist, and typographer. Grie Falcone, meanwhile, was Oreo's publisher and dust jacket designer. An accomplished children's book author and illustrator, Grie Falcone had been using her self-named Grey Falcon House to promote graphic design work for women's and gay and lesbian rights. One striking Grey Falcon poster from 1970, and God created woman in her own image, takes Michelangelo's The Creation of Adam and replaces Adam and God with a white woman and a black mother, respectively. Ross was the model for the black figure. Uh, a side note here that um, Scott Saul has pointed out how unlike the original creation of Adam, the two figures here do touch, do touch. Their fingers touch and, and that is as crucial of a revision to the original as the fact that it, the, the figures are replaced with a white woman and a black woman. Oreo would be Grey, Grey Falcon's only published book but it came out of a milieu that, for reasons both personal and political, were amenable to Ross taking control of her authorial vision. In its specifics, Ross and Grie Falcone's collaboration on Oreo was hardly representative of the work of black postmodern satire. 
few would have had as much say over the look of the final product. But the basic idea of a black author influencing the design of his or her novel holds for a number of novelists. More than a set of textual or aesthetic principles, novel design was the material substrate for and key innovation strategy within black postmodernism. To be sure, postmodernism's general reflexivity around reading and printed media encouraged experiments in design among authors and artists of varying backgrounds. Yet novel design took on a unique valence among writers who never had been taken seriously as experimentalists. For them, the book signified on itself in ways that indicated the virtuosity of black authorship as such. In this way, novel design names a practice associated not with the death of the author, but with her return as the prime mover behind the reading experience. Oreo gives us an unusually clear picture of what that looks like in practice. Frances Dolores Ross was born in Philadelphia in 1935, the eldest of three children and the only daughter of Gerald and Bernetta Bass Ross. Living in a house owned by Bernetta's mother, Lena Bass Nelson, the Rosses raised their family in a city that was known as a haven for middle-class blacks. Fran's familiarity with Jewish culture came from daily interactions with people in her neighborhood. She picked up some Yiddish from the Russian Jewish proprietor of her local corner store, for example, and she associated with scores of Jewish kids at Overbrook High, where she went to school. It was a time in West Philadelphia's history when the consequences of urban resegregation had not yet fully taken into effect. A talented athlete and artist, Ross earned a full ride to Temple, and she graduated from the Philadelphia University with a degree in communications and journalism in 1956. A few years out of college, Ross moved to New York City, where she worked as a proofreader and editor, first at McGraw-Hill and then at Simon & Schuster. Though it's unclear when she came out, by the late 1960s, Ross was in a relationship and living with Gree Falcone. From their six-room apartment on Riverside Drive, wonder how much that would cost today, uh, the couple ran Media Plus, a mail order company that produced and distributed educational film strips. Like her heroine Christine Clark, nicknamed Oreo, Ross was a misfit and free spirit a woman who lived by her own rules. She reveled in defying expectations. Something of her irreverence is captured on the jacket for Oreo. There, the author's bio reads, in part, she now lives in New York with her pet, mashed turnips, which she shapes into a variety of unreliable forms, now a bird, now a plane, now a human being of indeterminate sex. She is not now, nor does she ever intend to be, a lumberjack, short order cook, horse exerciser, waitress, or merchant marine. But who knows? So this flippant self-masquerade may have seemed out of keeping with the author's photograph on the back cover, which shows Ross standing in front of a window, glasses and writing instrument in hand, staring back at the camera. It was 1974, and not many readers would have expected such bold eccentricity from a black woman. Which begs the question, was the novel's title a reflection of how the author imagined herself? Grief Alconi's design for the front of the jacket may have suggested as much. Taking up a paper cutout technique that she also used to illustrate a children's book by poet Lucille Clifton that came out the same year, Grief Alconi created an image of Oreo in silhouette, brown skin on white background. In addition to the lipstick accentuated mouth, the reader's eyes are drawn to the star of David necklace plunging down the neckline. It's a more sexualized image of the heroine than what the text affords. Indeed, one critic has observed that the novel's feminist commitments are relayed in part through the repeated reference to Oreo's virginity and the implicit valorization of women who are untainted by sexual contact with men. Oreo's nerdiness, moreover, is muted by the cover's typography. With the title set in Art Deco typeface, the first and last letters serving as mini Oreos that anchor the image, the overall effect is to cast the novel as a kind of reverse jazz singer, the story of a chanteuse or showgirl 
who may be black on the outside, but is really Jewish in spirit. The novel design Ross brought to the interior of the book advances a more complex view of intercultural racial identity. A page of epigraphs precedes the table of contents. It reads, Oreo defined, someone who is black on the outside and white on the inside. Oreo, ce n'est pas moi, FDR. A likely story, Flaubert. Burp, Wittgenstein. Epigraphs never have anything to do with the book. At the bottom of the page, the asterisk point says, anything this profound philosopher, Wittgenstein, ever said bears repeating. Um, we, won't, we won't mention that to a certain faculty member at Duke. <laughs> uh, this slippery anti-confession, which is premised on the reader recognizing FDR as both author and designer of the book, credit for the latter is given to the same initials on the copyright page, confounds the very distinction between inside and out, interior life, and perceptual difference. People are not always who they appear to be, and book covers can be deceiving. And so it proves. It turns out Christine's nickname didn't derive from the supposed contradiction in her being. One night, her maternal grandmother, Louise, had a dream that she ought to call Christine Oriole. Louise looked up the word in her dream book, played uh, the number associated with it, and hit for $500 on the third day. Viewing it as a harbinger of luck, Louise started calling Christine Oriole. The only problem is that her southern accent made the word sound to West Philly ears as Oreo. When Christine's friends and neighbors took another look at her, they noticed her rich brown color and her wide smile full of sugary white baby teeth, which made them think of an Oreo cookie, side view. So the name stuck. The story of this odd but ordinary derivation is reflected on one of the first design elements that Ross created. The title page is actually two pages with the first O of Oreo set on its own and designed to look like an Oreo cookie on its side. In contrast to the dust jacket's Oreo cookie symbols, which support a kind of a bifurcated reading of cultural identity, Ross's big O reflects the lived complexity of Christine's character. The fact that this derivation comes from a mishearing of Louise recalls an important theoretical critique of black literary postmodernism. In Signs and Cities, Madhu Dubé posits that late 20th century black writers express disillusionment of the post-civil rights era as a waning of faith in urban modernity and the culture of print. The Great Migration, uplift through literacy and education, industrial urbanization, these once held out the promise of racial equality in America but over time, they came to be seen as extensions of the same old racist dynamics. Thus, in a reversal of Henry Louis Gates Jr.'s argument in The Signifying Monkey, DeBay contends that black literary postmodernism views the book with profound ambivalence, deeming its capacity to foster even imagined racial community diminished by hypermediation. In response, she says, many novelists have disavowed their chosen medium and have taken to recalling and refurbishing mo models of community and of racial representation developed earlier in the century. By this, she means that writers have sought the consolation of what print ostensibly sundered from community. Quote, the immediately visible face-to-face -face audiences of folk and oral forms of communication. Calling this tendency a romance of the residual, Dubé explains how writers come to figure African Americans as the guarantors of everything that is felt to be at risk in the postmodern era, bodily presence, palpable reality, political intentionality. This romance is properly understood as a fantasy of returning the sign of race to its grounding in a referent to the material reality of everyday life. Dubé considers Toni Morrison one of the writers most committed to residualism in a postmodern age. Morrison's theory of the novel, she writes, has been immensely productive for her own literary practice. The death of oral tradition is necessary to the emergence of the novel, 
yet the novel gains racial authenticity to the extent that it formally incorporates the oral tradition it supersedes. That's Dubé. So this seems like a facile interpretation. What Dubé breezes over as Morrison's effort to incorporate orality into the text is better conceived as the author's practice of novel design, a means of staging the reading experience using the tools and technologies available to her. This is a practice, in fact, that she took up in her debut novel and did not relinquish in her long career. In The Bluest Eye, Morrison inserts Dick and Jane primer text at the top of section breaks. And here I wanted to actually get the uh, first edition so that you, because the, 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 uh, the text at the top of some pages um, gets distorted in subsequent editions. So here in this first edition, I think we get a real sense for what Morrison was trying to do in, in, her, in her work. The text progressively bleeds into itself, creating an incomprehensible jumble of words. Here, Morrison aims to represent the distance between Piccola's self-conception and the ego ideal propagated by the white world. But you, the reader, are supposed to feel that distance and can only feel that distance by reading The Bluest Eye. So this isn't a rejection of the book so much as its meta-deployment as a vehicle for critique. Black postmodern satire turns the book on itself, frustrates how we expect to read a book, and this is what makes it distinct from run-of-the-mill postmodernism, precisely in order to undo the white conception of what a black narrative ought to look like. To do this takes vision, intention, and skill, effort that isn't reducible to an author's falling in dubious love with mimetic immediacy. Getting you to feel what Piccola feels, to read what she can't read, is by design, in other words. The same point pertains to Ross, who's more overtly playful in the way she conducts novel design. Oreo's most perceptive critic, Harriet Mullen, has argued that Ross's toggling between black and Jewish vernaculars is dependent on the cross-cultural literacy afforded by print media to any curious reader with the will to decode and comprehend a foreign language or culture. She also observes how Ross's deployment of jokes, riddles, cartoon, graffiti, advertising, palmistry, cookbooks, and dream books throughout the narrative is supposed to reflect not the essence of black culture, but the absurd comedy of Oreo's Bildung. There's nothing backward looking or defensive, in other words, about Ross's engagement with postmodern techniques. If there is a stand in for the authenticity of oral tradition in the novel, it's Louise. Yet upon hearing other people call her granddaughter Oreo, she proves as adroit as any postmodernist who glides on the elasticity of meaning. I never did like flying birds, just eaten ones, she said, but I just loves them Oreos. And this time she meant what everyone else meant. From a mishearing flying birds to a homonymic likeness, eaten ones, to an agreement on a new meaning, I just love Oreos, the novel's encoding of racial meaning is not rooted in essence, but routed through signification. The material dimensions of that routing is what novel design is all about. Far from disavowing their chosen medium, black postmodern satirists view the novel as a stage to perform literary virtuosity. The result is an author-directed assemblage of cultural signs that conduct rather than con concretize racial meaning. Ross's virtuosity in this vein is revealed in her design for Oreo's quest to find her absent Jewish father. In a departure from Dubé's pessimism about urban modernity, Ross, throughout the novel, creates set pieces where the signs of the city are exactly that which must be read in order to arrive at the source of Oreo's paternity. Here, the signs of Philadelphia and New York range from graffiti by Cool Clam, Cool Rock, Pinto, Timetable, Zoom Lens, and Cornbread, to transportation signage, to a crayoned message scrawled on the shopping bag of a Meshuggah, to public park signage, 
and to the yellow pages, where Oreo finds a listing for her paternal grandfather's box company, itself enclosed in a box. A wacky assemblage of references, citations, information, a logo, and original prose, Ross shows Oreo to be quite an adept reader, maybe not of books, but of the language of the Northeast Corridor through which she travels. What's particularly smart about these examples is Ross's refusal to draw a hard line between hand-created and mechanically produced signs. So we expect the public-facing signs to look a certain way, the heavy impression of the Penn Central logo and the prohibition at the park. The light impression, uh, as if gesturing toward the thinness of the yellow pages paper of Jacob Schwartz's boxed boxes. But Ross's approximation of graffiti and crayon writing doesn't seek to convey script as it really is. Instead, she standardizes these examples using small caps. In his classic methods of book design, Hugh Williamson notes that small capitals are similar in X height to the related Roman lowercase letters, and in proportion to their height, uh, they tend to be a little heavier and wider than the capitals of the same fount. Um, this is actually me, not Fran Ross. But this demonstrates to you the difference between small caps and, and regular caps. So small caps are not Roman capitals, which would exceed the X height and read as all caps. Nor are they lowercase, as we usually recognize it. Small caps are somewhere in between. And it's that in-betweenness that emerges as the effect of graffiti and crayon as well as of the Trenton Railroad sign that's missing letters in her typesetting. Um, which would be there. This was a deliberate choice on her part as, you know, as writing the novel was. Ross's approximation shows not signs as Oreo really sees them, but signs as Oreo processes them. Far from signifying literal script, small caps in the novel indicate the protagonist's consciousness as she pieces the puzzle of two cities together. Oreo's ability to read such clues allows her to navigate the six labors of Theseus, or the various obstacles standing in the way of her arriving at her destination. Two of the most harrowing obstacles involve implicit and explicit threats to her gender. The first in the chapter Skyron introduces Oreo to Slim Jackson, a mute sound recording technician and advertiser who communicates through messages scrawled on cardboard. His preset cardboard messages reveal Slim to be a pushy boss used to working with other men. When Oreo asks where she can find her father, who's also in the marketing business, Slim checks his language before she states the obvious. He'll be at the whorehouse later that night. It's the end of that. Cutting to the chase endears her to the non-talking Slim, who then asks Oreo to record an advertisement for Tanta Ruchel's frozen Passover TV satyrs. She completes the task with aplomb, prompting him to compliment. Nice voice. Slight Jewish accent. Obstacle overcome. Parnell the Pimp and Kirk the Stud, these are all characters from the novel. You'll ha you have to trust me. <laughs> Pose a more straightforward threat to Oreo's safety. In the chapter Circeon, the unscrupulous Hussars gang up on Oreo with the intention of taking her virginity. In mock epic style, Oreo fends off her attackers by drawing on forces that Ross signifies in design. Resorting to all caps, Ross first has Oreo defeat Kirk's attempt to penetrate her with a false hymen made of elasticium, a newly discovered trivalent metal whose outstanding characteristic was enormous resiliency. Elasticium was discovered by Citizens Against the Rape of Mommies, or CARUM, an organization whose membership was limited to those who had had at least one child before being attached. Carums, false hymens, are called maidenheads and are available in your choice of cherry pink, vestal virgin white, or black widow black. Pardell then is defeated by something more abstract, but shares carom setting in all caps. Calling on her wit, which earlier we learned stands for way of the interstitial thrust, 
Oriel deals sarcastic blows from head to toe, the irony of a foot in the mouth, facetious wisecracks, kicky repartee, striking satire. In short, the persiflaging of Parnell. Wit unleashes a barrage of onomatopoetics that turn regular words into fighting words. The italics, accents, and hyphens draw the eye to the violence Oreo unleashes on her harasser. As it pertains to the reader, wit is as exemplary a technique as any of what Glenda Carpio would call laughing fit to kill. So at this point, the question might be raised, right? To what extent is Oreo anomalous in her ability to read the signs of the city and to turn them to her advantage? Is she alone in the novel? Louise may be orally dexterous, but can she read signs too? Or does Ross fall into the trap of what Dubé defines as romanticizing black culture as the last vestige of authenticity left in postmodern times? In interlacing Oreo's journey with Theseus' search for his father, the novel, one might argue, risks reinstating the division between maternal kin and patrilineal absence that is a touchstone of Western symbolic and cultural production. Except, Ross takes care to undermine the assumptions we attach to such a division. While it's true Helen and Louise Clark do not literally accompany Oreo, they are, in a sense, with her all the way. Take her mother, Helen. Despite her father's disapproval of her marriage and despite her husband's fecklessness, Helen emerges a headstrong, self-determined female character. A Temple University graduate like Ross in real life, Helen is prone to thinking in equations. Facing a world, including, it turns out, a partner that can't handle a smart, eccentric black woman, Helen comes up with formulas to try to make sense of where she fits in and how she can provide for her children. That they remain largely opaque to the reader is the point. What she's gone through is incomprehensible to us, but we can at least glean Helen's unyielding will through her arcane abstractions. After Shmuel, or as he goes by, Samuel, abandons his family, Helen leaves Christine and her brother Jimmy in the care of Louise as she goes on the road as a touring piano player. Ross turns even this wrenching situation into an exercise in reading, a way to prepare Christine for what lies ahead. At the age of one and with Jimmy still a newborn, Christine initially has to have Louise read Helen's letters out loud. Helen writes the same thing in each letter. Mommy misses you and sends you infinity love. Except Louise reads infinity as lazy eight love or scribble love, leading to a less than ideal, albeit hilarious, transmission of meaning. By three, however, Christine is reading her mother's letters on her own. And in the very first one she silently reads, she picks up a crayon and shoots back a response. The scrawl is in lowercase, and it's written in a way that Helen has to hold, up, hold it up to the mirror to read, Dear Mom, cut the crap. So Christine will be just fine. Even though Oreo is on a journey to find her dad in New York, it's clear from the very beginning that her matrilineal line gives her the resources she needs to be a superb reader of the signs of the city. In addition to Helen's example, we have Louise, who, at least in speech, seems to conform to our stereotype notions of a down-home black maternal figure. But on the eve of Oreo's journey, which is also the night Helen returns home from a period of exile, Louise, hosting a big family dinner, draws up a five-page menu. This extraordinary layout features haute cuisine French headings, beginning with La carte du dîner d'Hélène, and moving through hors d'oeuvre, soup, poisson, and so on. But the hoity-toitiness is gently contrasted with a listing of items that is boisterously cross-cultural. Mexican, Greek, French, Russian, Japanese, Chinese, German, Jewish, American. It's a veritable Epcot center of food. Far from the soul food matriarch Ross has made us think she is, Louise's cosmopolitan flair is wildly on display here. But note that it's a controlled wildness. To create this menu, Ross followed the typographic 
typographical rules for the, quote, multicultural page. Play with different faces from the same typographic family and try out different combinations of a triad, Roman, italic, and small caps, within which type designers have worked since the middle of the 16th century. And that's a practice. That's a practice to create what's known as a multicultural page. The venue headings are not from the same family, avoiding what Robert Bringhurst calls incestuous similarity. But everything else is, with the American and Jewish dishes consistently in small caps, other dishes in italics, and wine pairings in standard Roman. In perfecting the multicultural layout, that is, of having variety and homogeneity at the same time, Ross shows Louise to be the unassuming experimental crux of both her daughter's and Oreo's adventures. Now, given where she's from and where she's heading, is it any surprise, right, given this matrilineal connection, is it any surprise that Oreo's finding her dad is a big letdown, right? Samuel is still a hustler and a cheat, unable to give Oreo the same kind of love, which is to say a love for reading, that Helen and Louise have given her. In truth, he doesn't have much of a chance to do so. On the day of their reunion, Samuel dies in a freak accident, falling out of his window and landing on a dog whose rhinestone collar pierces him fatally. Before the incident, Samuel promised that the secret of Oreo's birth lay in one of the books on his shelf. Oreo takes two books at random into the bathroom. Alexander Pushkin's The Queen of Spades and other stories yields nothing. But another book turns up a sheet of paper containing a telephone number and a span of nine digits. The latter separated like a social security number by dashes under the third and fifth integers. Under the numbers was one word. Aegeus. The numbers contained a secret, and the fact that they were hidden in a book titled The, um, the Egg and I is almost too on the nose. Her dad's kind of a literalist, or as Oreo puts it, Samuel's brains had been in his tuchus all along. After some phone calls, a forgery, and a Louise-esque masquerade, Oreo goes to the sperm bank and gets her rightful inheritance, Samuel's frozen sperm, from which she herself was derived after Helen had been artificially inseminated. Could there be any more pointed a critique of Western culture, of patriarchal dissemination? Theseus's quest to discover the truth of his paternity has been transformed into Oreo's casually holding her father's legacy in her hands. Her plan? To take it home. And if her paternal grandfather Jacob is welcoming, she'll consider handing it over. If not, down the drain it goes. Black, feminist, radically experimental, reading Oreo is inextricable from Ross's author function which manifests not only through her name be atta being attached to the novel, but through her practice of novel design. The book has all the hallmarks of a high postmodernist work. It's a metafiction of the highest order. And yet it also does exactly what Dubé fears. It loudly and pro proudly proclaims its blackness as well as its feminism. Except the book doesn't do this because they are essential to black people or to women. Oreo does this because it does this. It makes blackness and feminism happen. In this, Ross might be thought of as one of the earliest progenitors of what Nelson George and Mark Anthony Neal have described as the post-soul aesthetic. For George, post-soul names black culture's epistemic shift, quote, from gospel and blues rooted with a distinctly country-accented optimism to assimilated yet segregated citified consciousness flavored with nihilism, Afrocentrism, and consumerism. This consciousness, according to Neil, is without any nostalgic allegiance to the past, back in the days of Harlem, or the 13th century motherland for that matter, but firmly in grasp of the existential concerns of this brave new world. As I've described it, Oreo accords with these broad descriptions, though with a difference. Its break with the past isn't so clean or as masculinist as George's b-boy avatar of post-soul culture would have us think. 
Ross's figuration of the Clark matrilineal line suggests something like, we have always been postmodern, a point echoed contemporaneously and in subsequent decades in Gail Jones's fiction, Harriet Mullins' poetry, and Michelle Wallace's cultural criticism. This alternate post so genealogy finds its queer genesis in a singular novel design, sprung not out of Zeus's head, but in the collaboration between a black writer and her white partner. Of course, wanting to do it your own way, independently, especially in industrial book design and publishing, comes at a significant cost. Gray Falcon printed 5,000 copies of Oreo and presumably had to rely on the modest distribution that came with being a small independent company. Though Grief Falcone and Ross were in the media business, their work up to that point had been in film strip and ephemera distribution. Bulky, costly book distribution was another matter entirely. Ever the illustrator, Grief Falcone, using ordinary index cards, drew two maps of retailers on Manhattan that were carrying the book. We don't know whether these cards were used for promotional purposes or if they were merely the beautiful doodles of a talented artist and publisher. What they do capture quite clearly, though, is a slice of Manhattan book life in the 1970s, as well as, perhaps, the limited scale of Gray Falcon's distribution operation. How many copies were sold through these outlets? How many in other cities? It's likely we are looking at the primary location of the novel's reception in 1974 and many years thereafter. Black, feminist, radically experimental, and independent. Books simply weren't made like this then. Ross's novel design, as situated in the context of the artistic and publishing milieu that made it possible, was bound for obscurity. The book was first reprinted in 2000 by Richard Yarborough's Northeastern University Press Black Library series. Mullins' forward to that edition helped bring Oreo to the attention of other critics, but the academic press reprint could really only break into the college market. And once again, Ross's irreverence proved difficult to market to buyers used to reproducing knowledge in fairly conventional ways. Black and feminist books were certainly successful but Ross's peculiar combination of these identities still, still was a hard sell. Oreo was reprinted to much greater fanfare in the trade market in 2015 in the United States and in 2018 in the UK. These U New Directions editions have introductions by Danzy Senna and Marlon James, respectively. It's interesting to think about who introduces the book in which kind of market, US versus UK. Ross, who died in 1985 having never published another book, is deserving of the recognition, even if belated. She and Grief Falcone split in 1975, though the latter has been, by the account of Ross's brothers, a responsible guardian of the novel in the years since. A lifelong East Coaster, uh, Ross chased her dream of writing for Richard Pryor's short-lived televised comedy show. She moved to LA for the work, uh, but then was stonewalled, not so much by Pryor as by the team surrounding him, including the comedian Paul Mooney. Ross returned to New York, broke and disillusioned, where her writing trickled in, uh, trickled out in occasional pieces for feminist and gay and lesbian anthologies and magazines. So it would not be an, ex an exaggeration to say she's finally getting her, her due as an avant-garde writer and comedian today, in the wake of the New Directions paperbacks. But what's one remained unknown despite this revival is what I've described here today, a practice of novel design taken up not only by Ross, but by a generation of black postmodern satirists who, fitting neither black nor white conceptions of art in the late 1960s and early 1970s, figured they might as well do it their own way. Toni Morrison is almost never thought of as a satirist, Yet if we take her editorial experience at Random House seriously, and if we honor the fact that her typescript insists on a certain look for the Dick and Jane primer text, then why not call it novel design? And why not read her as being in conversation with the likes of Ross and others? A satirical bent to the bluest eye might be rediscovered, and a fuller story of how Morrison influenced Ross 
for whom she worked as an editorial assistant in the mid-1970s might be told. This is the kind of inductive literary history that could emerge out of our understanding of texts as material artifacts, as things that have been made by real people, as objects that are meant, in fact, to read you. Thank you.